the Sustainable Media Management Master's program, you are answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. But at the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. This seminar is sponsored by BEM Systems, Brown and Codwell, and brought to you by the Stevens Institute Center for Environmental Systems. So uh, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Sarkar and Stevens and the students for hosting us today. Uh, it's been an honor to sponsor with Brown and Caldwell your environmental sustainability series. I hope it's been a good semester for you. I appreciate you all being here today on such a beautiful day. Uh, it is quite gorgeous, probably the nicest day of the year so far. How many of you sat in our talk last year on coastal erosion in Alaska? You had to. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Well, uh, this year we're going to come a little closer to home. Last year we talked about erosion on the north slope of Alaska, 4,000 miles away. Now we're going to talk about our own backyard, a very interesting project that we're doing supporting our partner, New Jersey Transit. And John will be doing the majority of the presentation with support from, from Harold. Uh, probably most of you were here and were affected by Superstorm Sandy. Uh, back in October 29th and 30th of 2012. It's hard to believe it's been six and a half years already, John, you know, since it. Um, and John June joined New Jersey Transit within a few months of that. Uh, well, the, the uh, Congress passed authorization to help, uh, uh, help recover those communities. The East Coast was devastated in one of the most, most powerful hurricanes uh, in the history of the United States, and certainly the most powerful one that year. Uh, tens of billions uh, of dollars of damage, uh, 233 deaths, I believe. Uh, New Jersey Transit suffered almost uh, $480 million worth of damage, and it exposed uh, a lot of infrastructure to extreme weather, especially flooding. It's a low-lying, it's a lot of coastal assets. So transit was supported by the federal government, by the FTA, to help make their assets uh, as resilient as possible. Of course, there was a lot of demand uh, for funding. As part of that funding, the FTA put together a competitive resiliency program. So New Jersey Transit had to compete for $3 billion worth of funding. And due to the excellent work they had prepared in analyzing the risk to their assets, uh, Transit won five out of six grants. Uh, they got a, about 30% of the funding that was available. That was quite a coup for New Jersey Transit. Uh, the Port Authority and the New York City MTA tend to usually uh, walk away with the brass ring, uh, but Transit uh, did a great job. Uh, well, uh, five of those projects, of them, John and Harold are going to be talking about probably the most innovative and unique one. It's basically a mass transit agency building a, its own power plant in order to provide a constant source of energy even when the main power system goes out. Uh, there's a number of other projects that they're doing, uh, building a new bridge down over the Raritan River, and raising its profile. They're putting in new substations at much higher elevations and signals. They're building a whole new siding uh, to store trains in case of an event uh, down in Middlesex County? Um, yes. Uh, Delco? Uh, so a number of unique projects. But this one we're very proud to be associated with. Harold's helping John on the environmental processing and permitting side. So John uh, is uh, the leader. He is the direct senior director of uh, New Jersey Transit's en energy, Environmental Energy and Sustainability Group. So it's certainly somebody you want to talk to independent of this presentation uh, regarding uh, opportunities with New Jersey Transit. He's got a great group working for him, but he's always on the lookout for new talent. 
Uh, and I'll, at that point, I'll turn it over to John. Hopefully that works. Um, again, thank you for having me tonight. So it's John Geithner, work with New Jersey Transit, and the department that uh, I manage for transit is called Environment, Energy, and Sustainability. So a um, couple things to follow up on with Mark. First of all, again, thank you for having me tonight. Very excited to talk about New Jersey Transit in general, but in particular talk about a project known as the New Jersey Transit Grid. So it's a microgrid, and that term may or may not be familiar to most people. We're going to go through that tonight, what one is, um, and describe a little bit as to why it would make sense for um, a transit system to run a microgrid. So I guess before I start, I'll back up in history a little bit, but if you think about it, and if you're kind of a history buff, um, especially in the transit circle, you might remember that way back, actually began in Boston, transit systems were the first to innovate when it came to electric power. In fact, if you think way back in the history of the New York City subway system, right, from 1904 on, they built their own power plants. And those power plants were responsible for providing what we call traction power. Over time, the concept of electricity and generation changed a little bit to the model that we currently have now, which are distinct disparate generation points connected by a transmission grid. So, sort of strange, but that phrase, what sort of comes around, goes around, is really true when you think about electric power and transit. Because transit initially had the need for electric power, still does now, it got out of the power business, and slowly but surely it's getting back into it. So New Jersey Transit as a utility, let's think about that for a second. So you're familiar with PSE&G, right? Uh, local utility here. Maybe JCP&L, maybe Rockland Utilities, maybe Atlantic City Power. Those are the major utilities in the state of New Jersey. Strangely enough, New Jersey Transit is not only the largest consumer of electricity in New Jersey, we also are essentially the, maybe the fifth biggest utility in New Jersey when you factor in our transmission system. So you know our transmission system as the catenary lines over the tracks that power electric locomotives. You also know that those catenary systems are connected to substations. In fact, New Jersey Transit has almost 20 substations around the state to feed that power to its system. So between the substations and the transmission system, New Jersey Transit is actually a fairly large utility scale operation. What we don't have is the ability to generate electrons on our behalf. So we purchase them from the same as you do at home, from the utility operator, from the grid, so to speak. So what this project that myself and Harold will talk about is, you know, why don't we look at the possibility of maybe New Jersey Transit generating some power on its own behalf and what that would mean for its operations. So if I hope do this right, let's see. There we go. Okay. So, first and foremost, New Jersey Transit Grid. So, what we're talking about here, obviously, is a project that resulted from a particular event. And they say, listen, in your career and your life, it all comes down to certain events, right? So, if I think about my career for a little bit, Superstorm Sandy kind of defined my career to some extent. Um, as Mark mentioned, I came to New Jersey Transit in 2013. Prior to that, I actually worked in the petroleum sector. For a company, actually, you may have may recognize the name, a company called Hess Corporation. Hess Corporation had gas stations all over the place. They had uh, terminals up and down the East Coast in the Caribbean. They had a refinery in Port Reading, New Jersey. So I was on the environmental side of Hess Corporation. We reduced the sustainability report. We did the compliance work for the refinery and the terminals, a lot of air emissions type uh, work there. But in 2012, when Superstorm Sandy rolled in, it was a major, major hit, not only for transportation, but in the petroleum sector as well, if you recall, and I know, listen, I'm going to date myself a little bit by dating you, but many of you probably were just finishing eighth grade, going into high school maybe at the time, I'm going to assume, could be wrong, maybe some a little bit older. But if you weren't driving yet, you may not have realized, but listen, just the operation of just, just mobility in the state of New Jersey after Sandy was a crisis, right? And it came down to some pretty simple things. There was enough liquid fuel out there, there was enough gasoline out there, but to pump it from an underground storage tank into the tank in your car was only possible if there was electricity. We had no electricity. So working at the refinery and whatnot, listen, we had fuel stocks on hand, but we had no way to distribute or to provide to the end customer a way of getting that fuel out there. Sandy taught us a lot of lessons. Taught us a huge number of lessons when it came down to mobility and transit. 
So what we recognized after Sandy was that our system is heavily electrically dependent. And if electricity goes down, so does our rail service. If electricity goes down, so does part of our bus service, which also requires pumping of fuel from underground storage tanks into bus fuel tanks. So if you, use electric if you lose electricity, you lose mobility. And that's kind of a critical sort of a two and two that, that Sandy kind of revealed to most of us. Now, again, not that people weren't aware of it, but Sandy really made us more aware of it. So after SuperSum Sandy, right, so a bunch of customers lost power. We know that, 8 million people, more or less. Um, the power was out for more than a week. So by the time you get to more than four or five days, that's known as a catastrophic power loss. So there can be incidental losses on the grid. There can be one or two day outages. But by the time you get to more than four days, that's a significant outage. So Sandy, in some cases, was longer than eight days. But in general, the average is about eight days. All right. Our rail service certainly affected. In fact, up here are some pictures, right? So we had um, this particular station here is actually the Hoboken facility. If you can see, this is a lake outside Hoboken. Now, Hoboken is a curious facility built 1907 by the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad. Beautiful terminal, beautiful style, right? But built on piles not high above river level. Even during a, a um, full moon cycle, sometimes you get water on, on the track level. Superstorm Sandy put water at shoulder height inside the terminal. Significant difference there. So storm surge, right? So recognizing uh, uh, our facility here in Hoboken. So we had people who couldn't figure out where to go because there was nowhere to go because train service was down. These are people queuing up in Penn Station, New York. Um, again, um, a little hard to see from this picture, but again, various rail facilities, rail track, underwater. And of course, up here, one of the only systems that was still providing mobility to people was the ferry service. And even that experienced problems with fuel delivery for the ferries themselves and the ability for people to get to embarkation points for the ferry. So again, Sandy taught us a lot of lessons. If you control the power that you generate, you have a better way of providing a product to the end user. So that was one thing that Transit began to recognize. So after Sandy hit the Federal Transit Administration, government agency, part of the US Department of Transportation, had a, had a release of funds, had a funding mechanism. And basically the mechanism was broken down into three parts. The first part of the mechanism was go out there and fix what got broke. So New Jersey Transit was the recipient of immediate action funds, so to speak. So we went out there and actually did things like, for example, pump out the Hoboken station, redo the heating system, um, signal system along the rail lines that had to be redone, track switches that were no longer functional had to be replaced. So that was immediate action. The second part of what FTA said to the transit agencies was, you know what, take a look at your system and make it better or more resilient to the degree you can in the short term. So great, we took a look at different parts of our system, we made some improvements to make sure that the next time we had storm surge or the next time we had inundation with rainwater, the next time we had a storm like Super Storm Sandy, we'd be a little less affected. The third part of the funding FTA said was, you know, go out there and actually be creative. Do things that'll prevent a storm like Super Storm Sandy from having the effect it had on you. So that third part was called a Competitive Resiliency Grant Program. And as Mark mentioned, New Jersey Transit was successful in, in securing grants. So we secured um, $1.4 billion out of the pot. And as Mark mentioned, you know, usually MTA, which is a, a larger system, right, generally gets a little more money than we get. Port Authority serves more customers in some ways, gets more money than we get. We got a lot of money during that grant thing because we had a lot of good ideas. And what we want to spend some time on talking about is, is this good idea here. It's called the New Jersey Transit Grid. First and foremost, the New Jersey Transit Grid is really two different projects under one sort of umbrella called Transit Grid. So the first act, first act um, I guess the first way of looking at the project is to take a look and, and to understand that part of the New Jersey Transit Grid project is the construction of a facility to generate electricity. And I'll provide more details as we go through the discussion of what that facility could look like and what size it is and what that would provide for us. So it's kind of a non-traditional, traditional type power facility. And we'll talk about what that makes, uh, what, what that means. The second part of the transit grid was what we call distributed generation solutions. So listen, a lot of terminology, and I, and I don't want to assume 
that uh, people are familiar with the terminology, so I'll kind of go through it a little bit. So first of all, traction power is the power that you need to provide for motion. Okay, so from a transit perspective, traction power is what powers our electric rolling stock, locomotives. Okay, so the New Jersey Transit Grid traction power system would be designed to provide some amount of power needed for locomotion, electric locomotives. Okay, the second part of the product, though, this over here is called distributed generation. Listen. New Jersey Transit's kind of a, a holistic system, right? We have rail, heavy rail. We have light rail. You're familiar with the Hoboken um, HBLR, right? The uh, Hudson Bergen light rail system. And then you're familiar also with New Jersey Transit has a large bus system. So it's kind of hard to divide those things up because a lot of customers use what they call intermodal services. They'll come on a bus and they'll get on a train or they'll come from the light rail system to Hoboken and get off light rail and get on heavy rail and go somewhere, or go from light rail to the ferry system. So it's intermodality, right? So it's hard to really divide up these different silos of transit. It's kind of all a mix. So distributed generation solutions as part of the transit grid concept was to say, you know what? We need to make sure that bus systems that feed rail systems are also functional when there's a significant weather event. So part of the distributed generation solutions is to take a look at what bus garages need to have the ability to generate their own power and provide them that ability. Not emergency generators necessarily, but give those facilities the, the possibility of generating their own power all the time, okay? Whether it's a micro turbine, whether it's a large gas generator, all right? Whether it's some combination of solar combined with a battery storage system, those are the kind of things we're looking at, okay? In addition to bus garages, listen, train stations too. Trains may work, but if people can't get up and down escalators, if people are um, disabled and need the use of elevators, if those don't work in a train station, the train station can't operate. So by law, we have to make sure those systems work. Otherwise, the train can't stop there. You can't displace people into a dark place where they can't get around. So train stations have to be part of this concept as well, because our trains may run, but unless the stations work, the railroad doesn't work, right? So some of the distributed generation solutions would involve train stations. In fact, um, Secaucus Junction in the town of Kearney, um, Newark Broad Street Station in the city of Newark, Newark Penn Station in the city of Newark. All these kind of stations are what we look at in terms of distributed generation solutions as well. Um, listen, some other train station infrastructure, I'll give you this example. So the ferry system, right? So New Jersey Transit doesn't own New York Waterway, but we have a commercial relationship with them. We provide some funding to them from the FTA that goes to them, right? So we want to make sure that the, the ferry system works as well. Listen, if you don't have the docks, the lift ramps that can rise or sink with the boat as people are loading, those are electrically operated, they're not going to work. So let's make sure that those ferry systems have some kind of a distributed generation solutions that they're powered as well. So people go from one mode to the next mode, all those modes will work. Oh, wrong way. Okay. So benefits. So the transit grid, this microgrid system, again, the term microgrid may not be super familiar to most people, but a microgrid really is a very small localized power generation facility and associated transmission distribution lines. So instead of a national grid, like we have with the uh, PGM market and the New York market, the New England market, the Texas market, the Western US market, those are massive grids, all right? Hundreds of power plants, tens of thousands of miles of transmission lines, a microgrid is a much smaller scale. So some sort of a generation facility with the ability to distribute power from that generation facility to a load center, to an end user, okay? So during emergency conditions, when commercial power is not available to us, we want to make sure we can provide some level of reliable rail service. Now, just to be clear, it would take a lot of, a lot of electrons to provide full rail service, the kind of service that we provide during what we call blue sky conditions. We're not building that. We have an emergency service plan that we're required to have. We've looked at that plan and determined based on that emergency service plan, what facilities and what rail lines do we want to provide power to. That's what the New Jersey Transit microgrid is designed to power. Not the entire system, not from Trenton to New York and way out to the northern parts of the state. Can't do all that. But well, we can take a look at our core service territory, where most people would be riding the system, 
and we can build and scale to that. And that's exactly what the transit grid does. We want to make sure that we provide safe and reliable transportation opportunities for the public and especially to emergency responders as well. So in a situation where you can't use your car, um, either because congestion is, is too crazy to use your car in or because there's no fuel supplies for your car, first responders may have to use our system. We're conscious about that. We want to make sure that we provide opportunities for them to use the system as well. If we provide some degree of service during emergency circumstance, then we'll keep people off the road. Listen, after Sandy, it was a little strange, but right, so because there was limited liquid fuel supplies, not because it didn't exist, because we just couldn't get them to people's cars, we didn't initially see all the traffic congestion that could result, but in a circumstance, and again, since Sandy, so what have, what have service stations had to do? They've had to provide plug-ins for portable generators now. So if you look on the side of the local gas station you'll have, you'll notice there's a quick connect, because the laws changed after Sandy and gas stations had to provide that. So assuming that gas stations would have the ability to now fill your car with gas, um, based on an emergency journey that they have, a, a portable one, then in theory more people would take to the road in their cars. If we provide some degree of mass transit during an emergency, we'll prevent or hopefully dissuade people from using those cars. Again, problem with the cars, I mean, listen, the, clearly there's air emissions concerns, things like that, there's air quality um, things you think about, but there's also safety and congestion. So we want to make sure that we somehow can give people the option of not reverting back to a, a independent mode of transportation, but instead take mass transportation. And then again, one benefit of the transit grid system is, listen, during the course of construction for the various elements, we have economic activity, right? We have job creation, we have people who have the ability to do design work from the engineering point of view, do permitting work from the environmental point of view, get together, create a facility that eventually will employ people. So again, there's that benefit as well. There's an economic benefit. Okay, so I, I share this slide with you just to so have a sense of a place and time. You know, what are we talking about? So for the microgrid station itself, so we're talking about a, a, a small size power plant up to about 140 megawatts, okay? Again, in the world of, of power plants, that's not that big. Um, some of your base load nuclear plants, I think the biggest one we have is in Arizona, is almost 3,000 megawatts. So it just gives you a sense of scale in terms of what, what plant size is. Large coal burning facilities, large nuclear facilities, much bigger. This is a small microgrid, up to about 140 megawatts, okay? In terms of where it might be located, again, I say might because we're working our way through the environmental process. We haven't yet received what they call a record of decision from our granting agency. So I can't definitely say it'll be here, but we've done some research of where it might be. One place that looks like a good opportunity would be a place in Kearney. Um, on what's called the Kearney Peninsula. There's natural gas transmission lines there. We're juxtaposed with our main substation that we would want to feed power in that would power the wires overhead. And we're also very close to one of Amtrak's main substations as well that could power one of the rail lines that a lot of people use. So it would make sense, but again, we have to go through that environmental process to make sure that it's not an impactful site. Um, Assuming this is an area where we'd have a power station, we'd have transmission lines to, as I say, New Jersey Transit's main existing traction power substation, which is actually in the town of Kearney as well. We have um, an Amtrak substation that's along their northeast corridor. Just, I, I hate to throw terminology out here, but who rides New Jersey Transit on a reasonably regular basis? Once a month, let's say. Um, who rides uh, New Jersey Transit rail? Who rides New Jersey Transit light rail? Okay, who rides New Jersey, uh, New Jersey Transit bus systems? Okay, so bus is a little bit more popular, but on the rail side, New Jersey Transit is the inheritor of a lot of legacy lines. So some of our infrastructure actually dates back to the later part of the 1800s. For example, the Morris Essex line was built in the 1870s. That Morris Essex line travels obviously through Morris and Essex counties. Um, the Delaware Lock One and Western, which bought the Morris and Essex assets from that railroad, was chartered in like the 1880s. Okay, so we're talking about some pretty old infrastructure. So New Jersey Transit has lots of rail lines that are from predecessor railroads, the Erie Railroad, the Erie Lackawanna, Delaware Lackawanna Western, all these different railroads. Um, the Camden and Amboy Railroad, which actually was the first railroad in New Jersey, one of the earliest railroads in the country also, by the way 
Plus we have the Pennsylvania Railroad's infrastructure. Now Amtrak sort of is the post assessor of the Pennsylvania Railroad. That's known as the Northeast Corridor. You've probably heard of it before. It goes from Washington, D.C. up to Boston, travels through our area, travels across the Meadowlands area, right? Elevated track, um, travels into Penn Station, New York. So as part of the microgrid system, we want to make sure that we can power Amtrak's Northeast Corridor, limited, right? From possibly New York Penn Station to maybe as far south as the North New Brunswick area. That would allow people who are in New York during emergency to actually take rail service out of New York and alleviate, you know, congestion and crowding in New York. So we've got to make sure that we can hook into Amtrak somewhere. And the place to hook into Amtrak is one of the substations. One of the substations actually is in the, the Kearney Marsh area, um, known as Amtrak Substation 41. Amtrak numbered their substations as they, uh, as they rebuilt them. You'll also notice that we have um, this line here that seems to head east. And in fact, it does. So we want to make sure that we can bring power to the east as well. We want to make sure we can bring power to the Hoboken facility. Again, Hoboken is our single largest station on the system. Again, we, New, again New York Penn Station is not our station. But the Hoboken station is. We want to make sure that we can power that. That's important. A lot of trains emanate from Hoboken. Plus, Hoboken is a great intermodal connectivity spot, right? So we have New Jersey Transit bus, light rail, rail, New York waterway. So you want to make sure they definitely have power there. So power would come to power Hoboken. We'd power the station facilities as well. The HBLR system would also be powered, not so much from the, the central power station, so to speak, but from a sort of a nano grid. Again, if microgrid is this big, nano grid is this big, a nano grid system that we would install to make sure that the HBLR system has power as well. Listen, that's critical too. I mean, HBLR system, since it was um, developed and built, as you've seen the exponential growth in this area, a lot of it's attributable to the fact that people have mobility now between Bayonne um, up to north, just north of uh, 1 and 9. We're looking to extend that system as well. It's a little strange. The HBLR system, I don't believe, even goes into Bergen yet. But it soon will, we hope. So um, we're going to try to power that as well. So microgrid, nanogrid for the HBLR. The microgrid is going to power traction power going to allow for some limited service in the Northeast Corridor, which is a very, very popular rail line, as well as some limited service on the Morris and Essex lines, which also allow for people to, um, to leave New York and, and head there. Okay. So what's so special about this product? What does this product mean? It's a power plant, so what's the big deal? Well, kind of a big deal here is because, again, I mentioned that phrase earlier, right? So what goes around comes around. So again, strange, but way back in the past, Early 20th century, transit systems had their own power systems. Then we got away from that model. It looks like we're getting back to it a little bit. And the construction of the New Jersey Transit Grid is the first ever, certainly in this nation, construction of a dedicated power system for mass transit. Again, forget about the history for a second. Since, um, really since we went to the grid model, right? So we're going back to what we did. That's why it's kind of a unique project. Um, it was recognized for its uniqueness when the FTA granted us funding to initially do the, the, the environmental planning work, and Harold will talk much more about that, and to do some of the initial permitting work, and to do some of the initial design work. So where we stand right now is, is we have about 20% design completed. And until you get your environmental record of decision, until you've looked at all those impacts and, and judged them all and, and put them out in front of the public, you really can't go beyond 30%. So we've stopped at 20%. We have a good design. The plant is about 140 megawatts, or up to 140 megawatts. It's comprised of both a combined cycle system and a sort of a, what we call simple cycle combustion turbine system. So basically five combustion turbines. Um, the heat recovery system, or for two of the turbines, will power a steam turbine. So let's think what we want to power here. Um, well, we mentioned we want to power some of New Jersey Transit's load. That's important to us, right? So the Morris and Essex line to some extent. And the Morris and Essex line is, is not a huge load. Maybe it's about maybe 10 megawatts or so, a little less than 10 megawatts. Um, and I'll use megawatts just to keep it simple. We're not going to use kilowatt hours or things like that. That gets a little more complicated. But um, the Northeast Corridor. So we'd like Amtrak to show some interest in working with us to maybe purchase some power from the facility. Tricky thing with Amtrak, though, is I think um, you may, listen, I'm sure you certainly understand this. So we generate power in this country at, at 60 hertz, 60 cycles a second. Not Amtrak, 
Amtrak is 25 hertz. So historically it's curious why that is, but way back in the past, a long time ago, we had to make a decision about 25 hertz and 60 hertz. Originally 60 hertz was for residential, 25 hertz was for industrial, and then most industries passed to 60 hertz. I think there's one or two aluminum foundries, I think there's one in Tennessee that's still 25 hertz, but we've moved our industrial load to 60 hertz. Amtrak never made that conversion, so Amtrak is still 25 hertz. So if we generate power at this facility, we're going to have to condition it for Amtrak's need, which means we have to change that, that cycles per second down to 25 hertz. So the plant will have to have what they call frequency converters. Um, complex electrical device, but essentially it'll take the power we generate from the taps of the turbine, convert it down to the right frequency, and then send it out to Amtrak. Now that's good for Amtrak, but that has to be dedicated to them because we can't use that. All right. Um, some of our locomotives will dynamically switch between 25 and 60 hertz. Um, not all of them. So some of our fleet is dedicated to either 25 or 60. So we want to make sure that uh, we have the most opportunity here. But listen, the frequency conversion part of the plant, that's expensive. So we have to plan for that as well. Um, so that's a generating facility. Now, important to note, too, we mentioned um, innovation. The kind of thing we're interested in, right? So combined cycle, simple cycle, electric generation technology, it's been out there for a while. We want to make sure that we're doing it the right way. We want to be super conscious about efficiency. Um, super conscious about load factor, things like that. We also want to bring in some innovation too. So we want to make flywheels part of our facility as well. And if you don't know what a flywheel is, it's kind of a curious thing. It's a couple different types. Some flywheels get buried. Some flywheels more look like storage containers, like almost like shipping boxes. And basically flywheel technology is this. You charge the flywheel. You create mechanical motion. Flywheel is meticulously balanced. So that motion is as efficient as you can get. When you have to draw on the flywheel, you can discharge it, and you discharge it based on a pulse and a number of seconds. Some flywheels, depending upon the load, get discharged in a few seconds. Other flywheels can last a few minutes. We want to have for this plant flywheels that can last as long as possible, so they'll be continuously charged, and if we lose electricity, the flywheels will help us out. One key thing about the power plant is this, for those who are more in the electrical engineering thing, is locomotives are, are tough things to manage. Our locomotives are probably somewhere in the four to six megawatt range per locomotive. So from a dead stop to going to 60 miles an hour, it's a huge draw of power on that catenary wire. And when you have a system that has 200 locomotives running around plus Amtrak, a lot of variability in the grid. Now in a large national grid, you can deal with that variability. When you dedicate a small microgrid to manage it, you're going to have to find other ways to manage the variability. And one way to do it is to, is to use flywheels. So flywheels can take that shock of seven locomotives starting here, three locomotives stopping there and putting power back into the cable. You can deal with that, that variability, that electrical variability, through the use of things like flywheels. Okay, So that's another important reason why flywheels are out there for us. Third thing is we want to incorporate some solar. So again, depends on the site that we ultimately build the plant on, but we want to make sure we dedicate some of it to solar. Now, in all honesty, solar is not a great source to produce traction power. Sun doesn't shine at night. Um, to be able to store the amount of energy you would need in batteries to power electric rail transit, you need a lot of batteries. A lot of real estate for those batteries, a very expensive option. But what can solar, but solar can help us with a couple things. Solar can certainly help with general plant load, right? So parasitic load from the plant itself. Solar can also be grid tied. We can put it back to the grid as well. So we're going to incorporate some solar as well for the microgrid project. So between uh, simple and combined cycle power generation, solar and flywheels, it's a good combination that's going to deal with both the electrical variability of our load and the um, need to innovate a little bit and show that we have, listen, an eye toward the future, okay? So um, the other thing too to mention real quick, and I don't want to go too long here, but bottom line is um, we also have to make sure that we have substations. We've got to make sure those substations are built high, can't get wet, water and electricity don't mix too well. So part of our project over here is to upgrade uh, some of our substations along the way that can receive the input and to make sure if we need a, a new substation that it's built at, such a, at, at an elevation such that there's no issue with, um, with storm surge or with inundation with water, things like that. So I, again, conceptual pictures. Um, this is what it may look like, but obviously we see a solar facility here. Okay. Um, the plant itself, so not to give too much detail, obviously there's going to be an operating building. 
Um, we'll have water treatment, uh, obviously we'll have the combustion turbines here, emissions, we have here the, um, the yard, electrical yard, substation yard, right? The static frequency converters are, are somewhere in that picture as well. I think, I think they're these actual two boxes here. But bottom line is, um, essentially we'll generate 230 kilovolt. Some of it will be sent to the uh, frequency static, uh, static frequency converters. Some of it will be sent directly to another substation where it will be managed and conditioned for the, the need we have there. So combined cycle technology, substation. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but ps and has been doing a lot of pole replacement. Remember the old lattice towers that were out there? They're replacing them with monopoles. That seems to be the, the trend here. Um, lattice towers are important when you have river crossings and things where there's a high wind load, um, or you have wires that are coming from different directions. That provides more stability for you, but monopoles are good in most circumstances. So monopoles are being used a lot more. Okay? They're also, I guess, aesthetically, maybe they're a little more attractive. It's uh, the eye of the beholder there. Okay. So when you work on your environmental statement, you have to come up with your alternatives. So are we going to build it or not? And that's the, that's the most fundamental alternative. So the build alternative for our plant is everything we spoke about, right? So it's um, generation, it is substation work here from conditioning power, it's transmission. That's the build alternative. So we've gone into that a little bit in some detail. Um, where well, I'm going to kind of break off, and you're probably grateful because I'm probably taking up too much time here, and hand it over to Howard, Harold is when we start talking about what's the process? How do you actually get this going? Let's talk about the environmental process first. So you've probably heard of the National Environmental Policy Act, Council on Environmental Quality, right? So regulations that were passed a long time ago. In our world, if we get federal funding, like from the FTA, then we have to conduct an environmental analysis. It could be a simple one called a condition, you know, a, 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 what they call a CE. Could be a more complicated one, could be an environmental assessment, or it could rise to the highest level called an environmental impact statement. They're not uncommon. Um, you'll see them sometimes for highway construction. You'll see them sometimes for the, the tunnels under the Hudson project that's out there. Very common. But they take a long time. In fact, ours has taken Harold almost, hate to say it, four and a half years or so of analysis, of writing, of submitting documents, of having those documents reviewed, sent back with corrections and comments. It's a long process. Um, for this power plant, we are starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we hope that shortly we'll be able to publish the draft environmental impact statement to the public, invite some public comments, see what people think, what suggestions they have, what concerns do they have, work through those comments, and then eventually get our record decision. Um, again, I can't time it. Um, I would be a fool to, to try, but we're going to push as hard as we can to get it done soon. Because, listen, we have 20% design. It's a solid design. We want to move forward with the next step, which is to procure somebody to actually come along and finish the design for us, fit it, build it, and we'll see how the operations work out. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Harold, take us through the environmental process a little bit and some of the things we encountered. Thanks, Joe. How's everyone doing? Good? All right. Very good. Well, John, thank you for uh, bringing us up to speed on the project itself. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit is understanding the project, moving it forward through the environmental review process, and ultimately uh, being able to get something permitted through regulators. Um, specifically, John spoke about this project and the fact that it's federally designated as an action, um, obviously received federal funds from the FTA, and therefore we're governed under the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, the act ultimately wants to ensure, is this one? okay, won't see light. You want to ensure ultimately that you have good decision making in terms of a project you're proposing. Um, there's various components that go into facilitating that good decision making. One is to define your project, you have to really have a purpose and need. You know, what's your project about? What purpose is it serving? What need is it addressing? Um, you have to envelop alternatives. You know, basically, John showed you on this previous slide a preferred alternative and location and how things were going to be transmitted, but to even get to this stage, it took various alternatives to be able to display something of this nature. And all those alternatives needed to be taken into consideration. Um, what they considered was the affected environment. Okay, What were you impacted? Historic resources, natural resources, um, the general public, communities, um, and anything that buffered or abutted uh, your corridor or your project development. What are the environmental consequences of the footprint of disturbance you intend to, to develop um, for this project? Um, 
And in doing so, in developing a process and summarizing what we, we, what we would call an environmental impact statement, which qualifies the analysis of these various criteria, you would have interagency coordination. In this case, your federal agencies could be U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Army Corps, uh, U.S. EPA, uh, NOAA, National Marine Fisheries Service. Those are some of your federal agencies. On the state side, it could be DEP, State Historic Preservation Office, and all those fall under the umbrella of what is your National Environmental Policy Act and dealing with specific federal statutes which are then derived to the state to, to facilitate. From that interagency coordination, um, we're governed under a process which is a TAC review or Technical Advisory Committee, um, which provides an agency the opportunity to provide input on the project before it's released to the public uh, for their input. Um, this will impact you guys as you discuss, some of you use this, uh, these facilities um, for transportation. But as well, the intent of this project is to ultimately provide emergency transportation, limited emergency transportation. Um, if I was a parent working, for example, in New York City, okay, and I know I have, I have two children, and I have them in daycare in New Jersey, a catastrophic event takes place, I want to be able to get back to my kids. You know, so this type of facility um, and project itself would, would facilitate that, you know. And as John described it, it addresses key points to get you from here to there to ultimately get to your children. So um, the process is a federal process, and we're moving forward in doing that. We're in the draft environmental impact stage right now. Okay. As John mentioned, uh, the purpose and need of this project, obviously, is to address um, New Jersey Transit's rail service vulnerability to power outages, okay? As you see in this aerial image in 2003, that little triangle there uh, references that Northeast Corridor that kind of basically just went, went out in terms of light. Um, and I remember back then I was basically affected for about a, a month and a half uh, after Superstorm Sandy and using candlelight and kind of helping elderly neighbors and so forth uh, through that process. But beyond that catastrophic event, you know, New Jersey Transit has also been vulnerable and experienced uh, impacts from severe weather events. Um, not just your Superstorm Sandy or Hurricane Irene, but others from 2007 all the way through to 2015. So those individual events would be counterbalanced by a project of this nature. Further defining your purpose and need and what is uh, uh, defined in the environmental impact statement is what will the project address? You know, John spoke to a lot of these components, so I'm not going to focus in them, but as he mentioned, uh, service would be provided on a limited range to the Northeast Corridor or segment of it, Morris and Essex Line, and the HBLR system as well. As you may or may not know, uh, customer service, um, the project basically would impact uh, commuters, about 143,000 commuters rely on this type of service um, regionally. And the New Jersey Transit System excel it's, itself is not just connected to the MTA Port Authority side, but also SEPTA on the Philadelphia side. So um, maintaining this reliable service and resilient service is, is a key factor. Um, 52,000 locally, um, customers on the HBLR side, which you may be a little bit more familiar, um, utilize this, that system itself. Some of the project goals that we define in the EIS itself is, one, uh, to provide a highly reliable parallel power service source to support the resilience of New Jersey Transit and a portion of Amtrak's public transportation services, as John alluded to. Two, to achieve economic feasibility and cost effectiveness. Effectiveness. Uh, three, to expedite project delivery. You know, so John mentioned a pretty long time frame in terms of the environmental re review process, um, but there's key stages and milestones that we have to go through. And ultimately, uh, John, you didn't mention, but there there is a window of time that the funding is allowed to uh, to allow you to get this project approved, uh, basically out to the public, get your comments back get it through the regulatory process, and ultimately get a shovel on the ground. And if that's not achieved in a, 
a specific time frame, you lose your funds. So that's an important factor. Um, and ultimately, why do we do environmental analysis? Any thoughts? Aside from getting something approved? Anyone? It's a, huh? Impacts, okay. Absolutely. So that's a very good answer and that's, that's the key factor that we're considering and that's, that's the reason why an environmental impact statement is even done. One, to identify your impacts, as you mentioned. Um, two, to establish how your built environment uh, would impact those resources. Um, and two, to be able to demonstrate minimization. You know, the reason why NEPA is even done in an early stage is so it can help kind of twerk and facilitate your design to be able to get later on through a regulatory approval process. You know, just because you need a set amount of permits doesn't mean you will get them. You know, so you need to be able to demonstrate how you've minimized those impacts. And um, in the environmental review process under this EIS, um, there is obviously coordination with the public, there's public outreach, uh, meetings that are held, and you get the, the opportunity to get feedback from the general public in terms of things in the project that can help them and concerns and issues uh, that they want to voice, you know, so you need to consider that as well. Some of the resources um, and criteria we evaluated in the EIS itself um, are listed here, and, and I'll touch to just a few of them. Um, land use, zoning, you know, so if you have a project area where the generating facility is proposed as a preferred alternative, there are setback requirements for that development. Um, there's limitation in terms of how much impervious area you can put. Um, there's consideration of community facilities. You know, you have to be able to discuss how are you impacting fire, police, hospitals, schools. Um, this is a public benefiting project, so obviously there's a great benefit in proposing and putting a project in place like the transit grid and its DG component to facilitate access to those community facilities and obviously ensure that that's per that personnel is able to get from point A to point B to, to even help others under a severe event. Socioeconomic conditions are considered as well. Um, air quality, greenhouse gas, um, so there's a generating facility, you know, there's state of the art um, components to the design to be able to meet compliance under Title V for air quality. Um, visual quality is also uh, an issue that's evaluated. So when we talk about visual quality, it, it could be yourself that rides on the rail system and what you see looking from the train, yourself as a resident looking onto the transportation corridor and what you're used to seeing when you look out the window. If I walk down a sidewalk and I'm used to seeing an open space and all of a sudden a development comes into place, that's impeding my visual quality, my ability to be able to see what I used to see from my high rise, from whatever it may be. So those are all components that are considered. The, John mentioned there is a, a generating facility that will transmit electricity throughout this transportation corridor. Um, that implies that we would need various monopoles some would range up to a 220 foot height, per se. So one can say, all right, is that of great concern? You know, but then you look at the corridor itself. Is there anything already of that nature in place? You know, when we talk about the rail system, there are several poles already. So we're not really changing the character. However, we have to consider the poles, the cabling. You know, are you going in the ground, above the ground, working through other utilities that currently exist? Eventually, when the project is once it uh, seeks approval and moves forward, um, you want to ensure that you can actually construct it. Um, and all those factors need to be taken into place. Historic resources, um, we looked at a, a range from the preferred alternative of the, yeah, go ahead. Five minutes, Five minutes? okay. Um, a, a range of a two mile area and basically 16,000 feet um, buffer on both sides um, to be able to evaluate historic resources as well. Um, and other various components, noise and vibration. 
uh, during construction and obviously post-construction. I'm going to jump over just for the sake of time. Natural resources. Um, ultimately, the project enveloped a two-acre impact. That would be compensated uh, through use of another wetland system um, that's restored. And ultimately, that will benefit um, the Atlantic Flyway uh, and neotropical species that use this corridor. We spoke a bit about historic resources and just making a context-sensitive design to match that district, which uh, John had alluded to, the, the Lackawanna uh, Historic District. Um, and then there'll be signage in place to be able to educate riders and the general public on what is the significance of this resource. Air quality, obviously, under Title V will ensure appropriate measures are in place uh, to be able to uh, get the project approved in the future um, and to, to work appropriately. Land use, it's a use of a brownfield redevelopment site. That was aside from various uh, sites that were evaluated. Um, the intent was to reuse a brownfield uh, site uh, in a positive manner. Socioeconomic, there are significant benefits uh, in ensuring that communities are being able to continue to transport during emergency conditions. And obviously, there would be employment opportunities as well. Federal permits, Section 10404, okay, um, is a requirement under uh, the Army Corps of Engineers for work in waters of the US. Um, the state DEP also has several permits that would be required uh, for a facility of this type and the transmission of electricity through the corridor and the DG components. Um, I won't focus too much on those, um, but when we get to that stage post the record of decision um, and, and NEPA process, we would get into the environmental per permitting. So it's critical to address all your issues and get them addressed early in the NEPA process. Soil erosion sediment control, they have jurisdiction over any disturbance of 5,000 square feet or greater. And that requirement is basically you need to have best management practices, silt fence, hay, fail, hay bales, um, and, tr and uh, basically BMP measures to ensure you don't impact water quality. And that's basically it. John, I'll let you speak to the next step. Good, so next steps, so we want to make sure that we complete the environmental review process, and as I say, that uh, that process is um, starting to work toward completion, which we're very happy about. Um, permits we need permits, as Harold said, to, uh, to build and operate the facility. Um, finalize the trimmer's design, and again, our, our procurement method. We're still working through what that might be. Um, we want to make sure we have a design build capability with whatever contractor we work with. But again, if that's the way we want to go, that that's in process as well want to make sure we get to some final design and begin construction. So these facilities take about two years to construct and to commission. Commissioning is about uh, four to six months of the process. Um, and then once it's commissioned, it's operating. So we've got to make sure it operates as intended, as designed. And with all that, what questions do we have? 